we've been exploring the solar system pretty well, but like the dream is to send a spacecraft to another star system to see a picture of planets around Proxima Centauri close up. That would be life changing. And so a couple of years ago, we got this announcement from the breakthrough Starshot that they were going to privately fund the development investigation of sending laser powered solar sail spacecraft to Alpha Centauri. And work is being done and people are designing the hardware and the software and all of the parts that will eventually make this happen. But one of the big questions that I get asked a lot is like, how will they send this data home, right? You've got these spacecraft that are light years away and they're tiny and they have to somehow be able to transmit this data back. Now, they will be able to send data back and we will be able to receive it, but not very fast. And so the question is, is there a better way? And so my guest today is Marshall Eubanks. He is the chief scientist at Space Initiatives. He's worked with NASA and a lot of other space agencies in the past. And he recently wrote a paper about how you could organize a whole lot of spacecraft sent to Alpha Centauri into a swarm, and then they could communicate together as one that would send a much higher bandwidth back to Earth so that we'd be able to see lots of pictures, lots of data as this fleet of spacecraft is moving through another star system. So enjoy this conversation with Marshall Eubanks. Marshall, so do people understand like deeply, like the regular people, do they really get how big space is <laughs> in the no. sort of, you know, in the Douglas Adams sense of it? When I was doing um, very long baseline interferometry, I used to say that everything I dealt with was extragalactic. Because we were actually doing, we were we were doing astrometry. I mean, the, the navigation system we use is based, very long based on interferometry. It's universally called VOBI for obvious reasons, and um, the, the our navigation system right now is based on VOBI, and it's likely to be based on VOBI for some time to come, because that's the way we can look at very very distant things, the quasars that are. You know, I mean, we used to deal with redshifts. So a redshift of three was kind of fairly far away. Um, and most people have no, no conception of that. I mean, even compared to the galaxy, uh, you know, I mean, one way of thinking about it is just, you know, our descendants might well traverse the whole galaxy. If we had spaceships that could go at a fraction of the speed of light. We might send people or our machines or, or whatever across the whole galaxy, even maybe to M31 or other, the Andromeda galaxy, other nearby galaxies. We will never get to the quasars right. because general relativity doesn't allow that. Right. They've already They're, fallen over the cosmic horizon. Yes. We can see them, but in actuality, they are not reachable from us. They're like ghosts receding into the distance. Uh, there's Literally. this interesting paper. I'm sure you saw it. They came out a couple of, of months ago where they were making the case that we should just go f like build the you know spacecraft capable of going the speed of light as or just shy of the speed of light as quickly as possible so that we can sort of claim as much of the universe as we can reach i think it's like six percent of the observable universe is is within this reachable bubble of of us well that would be nice but how i mean ursula k Le Guin had nearly as fast as light NAFL spacecraft which would be very cool if you could do it I mean, you could literally get to Alpha Centauri in one day of objective time. Now, of course, four years would still have passed to somebody back on Earth. And so by the time you got back, it would be at least eight years later. That would be very cool. I mean, you know, but we don't know how to do that. Well, um, von Neumann probes, breakthrough Starshot style lasers, sending them at nearly the speed of light. And then when they arrive in a galaxy, they proceed well, to colonize the entire galaxy. Breakthrough Starshot, we're dealing with 0.2C. Right. And point yeah. two C is still basically Newtonian. I mean, if you're actually doing serious calculations, you need to use the relativistic equations. But the fact is, the time delay, the, the redshift, is not going to be that big. So if you if you have if, if you can make a spaceship for humans, it was that big. It would still take you eight years to get to Alpha Centauri. You know, you might save a few months, but it's not like it's going to be a day or two days or something. And the difference between eight years and eight years and two months, you know. I think in the paper they recommended dismantling Mercury was their sort of step huh. one, right? Dismantle Mercury, step two, hurl these at cl as close to the speed of light as possible at every galaxy that you can reach. Step three, colonize well, the entire That's one of the troubles I have with um, 
Dyson um, spheres, so-called. You know, if you read Dyson's paper, which is actually, I recommend everybody read it, even if you're not a scientist, because it's only one page. It's a phenomenally great paper all on one page. It's had a huge impact. But he sort of blithely says, you know, we should make, um, uh, dismantle the whole solar system, Earth, Jupiter, everything, and make colonial plantations in space. Like, really? <laughs> is that the best use of the Earth is to turn it into a well, giant Well, we've already plantation? started, though. Right. Like the, the argument I always make is that we have already begun building our Dyson Swarm, that when you look at the James Webb Space Telescope, it is a satellite that is harvesting energy from the sun. It is blocking sunlight from an outside observer. It is utilizing that to do work. In this case, it is observing the universe. And then each spacecraft that we add, SOHO, Stereo, uh, Mars orbiters, everything, they're all contributing to this Dyson swarm. So I argue we have already begun. It's just a matter of scale, how much of the sunlight we are actually consuming in an event. Either we will run out of need or we will run out of energy. Yes. I mean, the thing, my real objection to Dyson is that he, what he was basically saying is you have a runaway population explosion and you would have to deal, you have to do this Dyson of, Dysonification of the solar system to deal with the population explosion in about 5,000 years if population growth kept as it was in 1960. And of course it's slowed down since then, but you know. Um, but the fact is, is that that would only save you for about a thousand years. And then right. you would be like, well, we've used up all of this, this huge expanse of, of room we've got. And right. what do we do now? And so in hey. fact, you would actually have to deal with it at some point. So you might as well deal with it, you know, well before that. And I think, you know, yeah, I, I don't you'd think be like, Hey, Proxima Centauri, you, you know, can we use your star? <laughs> right. And the fact is, is that we we can observe this and we do not see that yeah. galaxies that have been turned into Dyson, you know, super Dyson. We don't see galaxies that have been Dysonified, you know, where all the stars have been turned into Dyson spheres. Um, yeah. there, there, there might be a few out there, but they're not, you know, it, it's, it's not that common. So whatever the aliens are doing, they're not... That's not what they're doing. I mean, my yeah. personal opinion is if if there are other aliens, they're likely to be much, much older, like billions of years older. And in billions of years, you have enough time to go throughout the solar, the, the galaxy and, and do what you want, more or less. And so the, the galaxy is the way they want it to be in that scenario. Right. That's very so three-body problem. If you've yes. read the, those books, you know, yes, the I sort have. of, yeah, I'm, I'm not as negative as, uh, as pessimistic as they are, but, right. but yes, I mean, it's, you know, it's so the reason, the solution to Fermi's observation, which I prefer to Fermi's paradox, um, because it really is just an observation. We don't see lots of aliens around us is that, um, you know, we see what they want us to see. Right. Um, it, there's an analogy. There's a book I was reading where they were talking about how like if you walk through a what seems like a primordial forest say where i live here on the west coast of of canada and you see different kinds of tree systems and and so on it looks like it's just like this is just nature at its to rawest form but actually you can see humans presence that there is forest fires have been shaping some of the terrain that certain kinds of trees have been planted in certain areas and so it's such a mind bending idea we think about if we look at the universe or we think, look at the Milky Way and say, you know, is this a domesticated Milky Way already? Is this what some advanced civilization has thought is the best possible version of what a collection of galaxies should look like? One of the mind blowing ideas that I, I, I you know, that, that's, that's literally true. And I just find this mind blowing. The galaxy, our galaxy, as best as we can tell, was originally something like a... Um, an, an elliptical galaxy, which was just the bulge. So we, the galaxy started with the bulge, and there was a there was a huge starburst in the bulge. Which and what that means is there was a huge runaway um, star. You know, gas would collapse the stars. Stars would supernova and put out more gases and more hot, more higher. You know, what astronomers call metals, which could be metals, but also carbon and so on. And then stars would form from that. And that all lasted about 2 billion years, maybe or so, in the very early galaxy. And then it stopped for whatever reason. Maybe all the gas was used up. We don't really know why it stopped. But if you add 4 billion years to that time, you get about the time when the galaxy started forming its current spiral structure. 
And so you have to wonder, could the spiral structure be, could the, you know, could our spiral galaxy be actually an engineering construct? Could somebody, some, some entities have decided, well, for whatever reason, we want to make lots of planets and stars. And how do you do that? Spiral arms. And so we need to merge these galaxies together, munge them together and, and make, you know, beautiful spiral arms. They just art project. You know, we like, spiral, they look pretty. Um, but for, but then, the, then if you say, well, why don't we see them? It's like, they're all around. It's like, we're in it. It's, right. They're all um, done. Yeah. It, and that is similar. Like we're going to get to like the interview portion, but this is, you know, every, whenever Marshall and I talk it, it is this. So, you know, buckle up. Um, but there's a, there was another paper that I read recently where people were saying like, like the most efficient way to build mega structures is to use existing terrestrial planets. And you just use slight gravitational slingshots to shift these planets into habitable zones. And so then in fact, the, that that's the easiest thing you can do. You have know, set an asteroid back and forth, stealing a little bit of gravity from or orbital momentum from various planets. You shift them into habitable zones. And in fact, so the thing that we should be looking for is planetary systems that are just chock full of planets in the habitable zone because. Yes. Well, that could convenient. be subtle. I mean, take the solar system. Now, you know, I know people that have talked about terraforming Mars. And I'm actually, I, I was more interested in terraforming Venus because it's, it's, and since it's more doable, and, and I don't think anybody would care if you got rid of the hellscape that Venus is right now and replaced it with something with oceans or whatever. You're not going to have, you know, save the, save the runaway greenhouse, uh, you know, NIMBYs. Um, but one thing you could do is swap Venus and Mars. Because if Mars was close to the sun, it would be nice and warm. And if Venus was further away, it would be naturally cooler. And if it was, if Venus was sufficiently far away, the runaway greenhouse would stop, you know, and you would, now this would take a while, you know, like millions of years, but you would eventually get to a much more Earth-like planet. And in both cases, you would have trouble with the amount of water they have, certainly for Venus, maybe, maybe not for Mars. It depends on how much is in the mantle, but... But you can fix that as a principle by taking in stuff from the outer solar system and just impacting it. Um, because after all, it's, you know, there's lots of ice out in the outer solar system. There's no shortage of ice. And we're just, you know, it's just the location. It's not where we want it. All right. So, so focus, Fraser, focus. Um, and that's something you could, break, you could think about doing in a 10, 20 million time year. Uh, years, right. Yeah. You know. break and if you're thinking shot. about organizing the galaxy, that would seem like, you know, it's what you do with your backyard, kind of. It's like, right. you know, we're going to move the gazebo over there. And we're gonna, well, let's, we're gonna, well, let's crawl before we walk, and let's talk about Breakthrough Starshot. So you are involved in the Breakthrough Starshot program. How did, you, how did they rope you into this? Well, I feel like saying, how far back do you want to go? As far back as you <laughs> think is necessary. Well, so when we found one eye, one eye, Umuamua. I'm just going to pronounce it that way. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but we found the first interstellar asteroid. It, we actually, you, you might say, how did you find it personally? And I found it personally through the minor planet mailing list. And somebody posted an email saying, this is a very strange asteroid and its eccentricity is large, but sometimes you get large being more than one. But sometimes you get asteroids or comets, more likely comets, but you get them that, that have large eccentricities, but is, you don't have a lot of data and this orbit's just in error. And I looked into the, um, uh, the orbital the velocity to infinity, the velocity you would have if the thing went out to you know, escape the solar system or how much it lacks from escaping the solar system, so it's, that's a negative velocity to infinity. And the thing is, a velocity to infinity of like 30 kilometers a second. And I said... If this orbit is not totally whacked by some error, this is a real interstellar object. And already then, and so there was a, a few of us who started talking about this and sort of promoting it, and already it was like, geez, it's past perihelion, it's past closest approach to the sun, to the Earth and the Sun, it's moving away from us at a really fast clip. Our ability to observe it is declining noticeably. How, what can we do with this thing? Our ability to do occultations is, our ability to do radar is gone. Our ability to do occultations is going to close in like a week or so, and it's not time enough to organize a campaign. 
All we can do is try and get time. I mean, and I was not part of these groups, but, you know, get, try and get time on telescopes like the Hubble and see how long you can observe it. And unfortunately, the web had not launched then. And so we didn't have, you know, we could probably, the Hubble observed into early January of 2018. We could have observed it probably another six months or so if we had the web. And we had the time on the web, which I guess that we would have gotten. I don't know. Um, and it just, it seemed like, well, and this is before the anomalous acceleration. This is before the the the, uh, the chaotic rotation. This was just we know the orbit and we know it's moving away, and we want to find out about this guy and how can we do that. And so it seemed like even then, well, let's go to it. And even then, it was like even if we'd ha at that point, even if we'd had like a, a New Horizons on its rocket ready to go, and we could have gone in there and hijacked and said, no, you're not going to Pluto, <laughs> you're going after this guy. It would have been too late. So, and of course we didn't, we didn't have a space car, any, you can't do that anyway. It doesn't work like that, but, and, and so it's like, okay, so if we, if we have a, a crash program, and this is 2017, we have a crash program, maybe we could launch something by 2022. And at that point, it's already well out of the inner solar system. And so we're going to have to do some gravity assist. And, we, and I started looking at gravity assist and I realized pretty quickly that we were going to have to do an Oberth maneuver by the sun where you have to go into the sun. So now you have to, the, the way I was focusing on was you go out to Jupiter, you use a gravity assist at Jupiter to kill your velocity around the sun. So you fall into the sun almost, missing it just by a little bit. And then when you're closest to the sun, you're moving around 100 kilometers a second or something like that. You fire your rocket, add two kilometers a second, but by the magic, you know, cool physics, Oberth maneuvers, you can then gain enough velocity to get to it. Except, well, like it's hard to get, you know, get out of the ecliptic plane enough to get to it. But so I was working on these things. And then I heard from somebody, and I don't even remember who, I have to dig into the emails, that the Lyra group was working on the same problem. And I had heard about them before, and we, you know, I knew some of the people. And it just seemed like, well, we should work together. Because, I mean, the orbits are the orbits, right? They're working literally on the same, you know, the same idea, same problem. I mean, you know, it, the launch dates were about the same, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, let's join forces. And Adam Hibbert, who was working with him, is a really, really good celestial dynamicist or astrodynamicist. And um, so he saw, he took over the orbital part of that. And we've actually written a number of papers on how you can get to one eye. And unlike what certain well-known astrophysicists say, you can get to one eye. If, if we wanted to do that, and if we wanted to put the equivalent of like a SLS or heavy Falcon heavy launch, we could get to one eye. It would take probably about 20 years. Um, and so you're talking about a billion dollar spacecraft. That's not a trivial amount. But on the other hand, it's not like the Manhattan Project. It's not like, you know, we're, we're hijacking all of society to get to one eye. And that was just purely for science. That was before anybody much was talking about, well, this might be an alien scout or something like that. Um, but one of the things you would do is you would want to have, I mean, you don't have a lot of mass. And so you have to think about, well, how can you get out there? How can you communicate back? What, you know, what can you do? One of my ideas that I, I've been pursuing ever since is you have little sub probes, um, what I call collision induced breakdown spectroscopy. You're hitting it. When you, when you hit things fast in about 10 kilometers a second, you start breaking molecular bonds very effectively. And so you get the, the, the sort of the high energy, um, uh, spectral lines like the you know, hydrogen balmer line and that kind of stuff and so you can say from the lines from just from the, the spectra of what of the, of the flare of when you hit something what's what is it made out of and you can actually you can even do isotopes and stuff that's a little would, would that give you a flyby or would that be yes a flyby we're talking it's, about fast flybys we're talking yep. about you know i mean when i said a 20-year mission the 20-year the mission would work like 20 years to get there you would detect one eye a day before you, you, the spacecraft would be able to see it. Now, you can't see it from Earth, so we would know nothing about it until, you, until about a day before encounter. And then the encounter would be at like 20 kilometers a second or something like that, uh, 15, 17 kilometers a second. And all the good stuff would take about a second because it's so small. Right. And so you would send like a bunch of, of shrapnel at it, see the see the spectral so, lines as yes. you're kind of going past and use that to try and get a sense of of what it's made of and what it's made out of and of course systems. one of the things i thought then was if you 
let's say your spacecraft gets there and it starts taking pictures and it takes a pretty picture and it's obvious that one eye is an alien spacecraft. That's you're beyond the round trip light travel time from Earth. That's that's several days at that point. And so if your if your spacecraft is going to hit it with shrapnel, it's already going to hit it with shrapnel. <laughs> Right. And you on Earth had no ability to to change right. that. There's no your you could say no, don't do that. Yeah. But your Apologies message will get in advance. To, uh, <laughs> and well, and so I actually thought a little bit about well, would you actually want to have code, you know, software code in your spacecraft to like, you know, if it looks like this, don't release the kraken, don't release the probes. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously that's a problem because well, what if it just happens to look like a floppy thing or something you say well that might be a spacecraft and then the mission doesn't happen because you didn't you know your your spacecraft autonomously decided it wasn't going to do its thing uh it, that's an interesting problem if you think about it one we haven't had really had to face in space travel but um right someone needs uh, to build a, a machine learning algorithm for spacecraft to identify alien spacecraft yeah, yeah. i mean that's a kind of tough problem if you think about it you just feed a lot of star trek episodes it'll be fine you'll get it <laughs> One of the troubles is the ephemeris errors for one eye. I mean, it's uncertainty now and forever, basically, is a, a order of lunar distance. It's about 100,000 kilometers now. It's going to grow with time. And that's far enough. It's, it's a 100 meters body. It's, it's, it's very dim and out there because the sun's dim. And it's very tough to find it and get to it. It's, remember I said you'd find it a day in advance? So you'd have to have a big enough rocket to move over 100,000 kilometers in a day. Or, or another way of thinking about it is you could, you know, you have a, have a big enough rocket to get to the moon in a day. And that's a pretty big rocket. That's a pretty big delta V. And so we decided, no, what you need to do is have a set of microprobes that you send early that get to it a month in advance or something like that so they can find it and then report back, here is exactly where it is. And so he, so now you have enough time that, you know, so a few hundred meters a second, maybe you can move over and get to where you need to be. Or maybe you do that as two separate probes. And that was actually where I started getting interested in the Breakthrough Starshot stuff. Because I thought, well, if they can send these little pie plates to Alpha Centauri, they could send them to one eye, and then they could do that job before we get to it. And so they could answer that. And... And um, and then then and the way that these things happened, there was a call. There was a there, you know a call for proposals, and so we proposed to do a swarm, and it was uh, for Alpha Centauri for Proxima Centauri. I mean, really, you'd go to both probably if you're going to build all this infrastructure, you'd do both. But for whatever reason, people focus on Proxima, so it's it's all focused on Proxima Centauri. But that's where all that started, and and we did the we did the proposal. And it was kind of like doing a NIAC, if you know NASA NIAC proposals. And, um, you know, and I had no idea if it would be accepted or not. I had no idea, if, you know, but we were. So that's how we got into that. We were, you know, given a grant. And, and so what was the idea that you were proposing when you talk about this idea of a swarm? Well, it's gotten a lot more complicated over time. But the... The breakthrough star shot seems like it's going to be technologically very tough. We will need, pie, the, I, I call them pie plates or pizzas. I mean, they'll probably be several meters across, so they're, they're, they're big, but they'll have a mass of a few grams. And so they're very, very light, like aerogel or something like that. And you have a laser that's shooting a light on it. So it's literally a photon rocket. Except you're not generating the light on the object. You're sending it up from Earth or the moon or wherever your lasers are. And if you run through numbers on that, you rapidly realize if you try for, you know, Yuri Milner wanted this to happen in his lifetime. And that basically meant you needed to do this at point two C. And to get to point, and that's a reasonable number. Because you get much faster than point two C, um, you start getting a lot of problems with the interstellar medium. It starts heating up. Um, it's already at point two C, you're in this bath of MEV protons from the interstellar medium that are, you know, they're not moving fast in the galactic frame, but they're moving fast relative to you. They're hitting you. And that's a, that's a problem. That, that causes erosion. That will literally erode away any fa forward-facing surface to millimeters, maybe even a centimeter or so. Um, and as you go faster, that just gets worse. 
but so point two C is a reasonable number. It's you know fast, but it's it's not quite over the hairy edge of of. But it's also a reasonable number in that you're you're talking about hundreds of gigawatt lasers, and that's a lot. That's all you know. Right now, hundreds of kilowatt lasers is sort of what we can do. But you know, the various militaries would like to use lasers to shoot things like drones, and the U.S. Navy is one of them, and they're they're funding laser development and. Um, and if you just sort of run through, like, you know, what would the heating be? What would the, I mean, that's a substantial fraction, 100 gigawatts. It's a substantial fraction of the whole United States electrical capacity. Now, that will grow with time, so 20 years to be more. But um, so that, or to put it another way, that would be 100 very large nuclear reactors devoted to Starshot laser propulsion. Now, and, and so it's it's just not realistic to say oh we'll make it a hundred times bigger or something like that you know oh we're gonna, we'll send a hundred grams and we'll just by just you know instead of a hundred gigawatts we'll to you know ten terawatts that's just not it's yet it really fundamentally that seems not realistically not realistic now maybe in fifty years we'll have different opinions I don't know but you know right now it's like no we're limited at sort of a hundred gigawatts or so and. But you have, but the the cost is in the infrastructure. You have all the lasers. You have the telescopes because you need telescopes because you need to point the laser beams very accurately. You have this huge infrastructure that's maybe several square kilometers worth of high tech equipment somewhere on the moon. Maybe I think it would be best on the moon. But, yeah, you far know, side of the moon. Keep that away from of, us. Far side of the moon. Yes, so yep. that nobody could point it at the Earth. You know, uh, you could zap Mars maybe, but not. Uh, you couldn't zap Chicago. Um, you couldn't do it. The moon is a harsh mistress, if you remember that star, science fiction story. Um, and but what? So once you build it, you would want to launch more than one. Why not? I mean, everybody's thought. I mean, that's not original to us at all. Everybody sort of thought that. And so people thought, okay, well, you pointed at Proxima Centauri, say, and you just start shooting these out, and you're shooting one an hour, maybe, or one a day, or something like that. Some 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 number like that. And so in a, and let's say you do that. And of course you could, you know, probably don't want to do that when it's close to the sun. And so they'd have a yearly cycle there. If you not on the moon, the moon, you avoid all this, but on, on earth, you have these problems. You'd like to do it at night and so on. And so, so maybe you have eight months when you can do it, something like that. And so if you think about it, well, you know, eight months is 240 days. So we could maybe send a thousand of these probes. In one campaign, so maybe we send one thousand to Proxima Centauri, and then next year we send one thousand to um, uh, Alpha Centauri, and then maybe some other Sirius or some other star system. Sirius would actually be in range of this, this system, so you know, there's no probably almost certainly no life on Sirius, but it's an interesting system. You know, in any case. Our basic fundamental idea there was we should join these things and have a coherent swarm. And that means they have to come together. And that means you have to do what in the military is called time on target and velocity on target. And so the time on target means you, you, you send the first objects a little slower than the last objects. So they catch up. And the velocity on target means you have to, so the, 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 the whole string is with time co collapsing. Now you could arrange that, and it's just that's just math. You could arrange it so that it, they meet, but then if you do nothing, they just intersperse and keep going. So the first idea was where they meet right at Proxima Centauri. So you have right at Proxima, you you you've really timed this so well. So here's the star, and you just come together like this, and you're all right together for like you know a minute or something like that. And right, and it just seemed like well. Make this can't you make the swarms amount? It's like yes, you actually have a fa fairly amount, substantial amount of drag in the interstellar medium from this I MEV mega electron volt bath of protons that you're facing, and you can use that to slow down, and you can use that to tack too, so you can you can bring the swarm together. And now this is slow, but you got twenty years. That's a bonkers so, idea. So I just want to sort of stop for a second that you can tack right, that you're using the because you're going at relativistic velocities, what was the just the 
the uh, air that you're moving through, in this case, the interstellar medium. A much through, better vacuum than we can make on Earth. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most, the, the most perfect vacuum. You're moving through it so quickly that you're inducing drag that you can then use to provide lift, to provide control surfaces on your solar sails to aim better through this journey. Yeah. So they're literally sails. That's they're bonkers. not just solar sails, but they're literally, yeah. you know, and... I mean, then the math seems to work out on all of that. Now, there's a there's a huge caveat here, and that is that we don't really know the interstellar medium that well. We know from from observing, like Alpha Centauri, and doing spectral lines. You look at spectral absorption lines; you can see there's stuff absorbing in the middle. You can get some idea of like its velocity and so on and so forth. But that's very crude. That's sort of like a light year average. Serious too. You can do this with serious to get a light year average. Um, and we also know from the Voyager spacecraft, because now they've penetrated the heliosphere and they're out there, that there's sort of, you might say, high frequency stuff going on, a month sort of time scale, of, you, know, you know, one AU across or something like that, that there's some sort of turbulence or something. We have almost no idea in the middle, <laughs> you know, how. Now, it, it can't be like too high density because you'd see it in the spectral data. Um, but is it like more or less uniform or there be, you know, I mean, you it depends, you know, this drag depends on uh, the density of this stuff. And so is it going to be like going over a bumpy road? I mean, metaphorically, probably wouldn't feel it if you're on the spacecraft, but, you know, or is it just going to be like smooth sailing? You know, if you ever do sailing on the ocean, you know, that makes a difference, right? You can be on the ocean where it's like smooth as glass and you're just out there sailing and you can more or less do yep. anything. Sailing right? downwind. Yeah. Yeah. Downwind. But then you can be on the ocean when it's like, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and you're beating the windward and so then easy. it sucks. Yeah. And and in fact, of course, that means that these, these probes, that'll be one of their scientific results is, you know, we will know a lot more about the interstellar medium when we get to Proxima Centauri than when we left. And maybe we want to send out precursors that go halfway there or something. I don't know. You know we're, think, we're sort of contemplating all of this for a paper we're writing, a science paper we're writing. You know, like what do you do with precursors? And, you know, but, and, and, and we don't actually, so there's, if you look at the interstellar medium with these spectral lines, there's huge bubbles, which actually we think, I think a reasonable model, and I, you know, I'm, I think this is more or less the consensus is, these are old supernova bubbles. So there's, in the past, there was a supernova that caused a big, huge gas cloud to go out, kind of like the Crab Nebula. I mean, the Crab Nebula is several, AU, several light years, not AU, several light years across. So just, just imagine you had a Crab Nebula a million years ago, makes this big bubble, and you don't see the nebula anymore, but the bubble is still there in the interstellar medium. So the, the so-called the, the, the LIC, the local interstellar cloud, is well from the name we're supposed to be in it but actually right on the boundary between that and another cloud that alpha centauri and proxima centauri are in and now when i say right on the boundary the boundary might be ten thousand au so this is big compared to voyager but we don't actually know which cloud we're in or if we're in some sort of transition region i mean we really don't know much about this and it and but the clouds have a different density and they have a different velocity and so the drag will be different and so you you know you really need to know all of this you know i mean i think one implication there is it'll be like sailing on the ocean you know one of the reasons the british had a, such a good navy back in the 17th and 18th centuries was they did a lot of sailing and so they knew where the good winds were and where the good currents were and all like that and so once you do this a bunch yeah you'll know like you know yeah it's pretty good going this way but if going that way it's you know not so good and, you know, there'll be a patch where you're not going to get a lot of drag, and so you want to do your stuff before that or, or whatever. Um, but we're not there yet. <laughs> and um, and that may take a few decades to sort out. Uh, so, like, in terms of swarms, like, what, you know, you, you looked at a bunch of these ideas, thought about, like, well, let's time everything so all of the spacecraft arrive at the same time. I mean, I'm guessing different kinds of swarms have different values for science as well as kind of operations of, of the mission. So, I mean, what are some of the possible kinds of swarms that seem to make well, sense? So one thing we want to do with the swarm, well, so we want to bring the swarm together. The, the primary, the, the core thing we want to do is to increase the amount of light going back, to, to increase the, the data rate going back. 
an individual small probe with a very low power amount of power is just not going to have a very high data rate coming back. So they were talking about a year or more to send one picture back, maybe, you know, where you're you're getting like a bit per second, maybe, or something like that, and a photon per second, and and so our idea was what. Well, Put all these things together and make them coherent in a photonic, what I call photon coherence, which is to say, you, you're 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 uh, you're you're not trying to get phase coherence because phase coherence means everything has to be controlled a sort of the micron level or better, micrometer uh, level or better, which is tiny, you know. Um, you're you're getting photon coherence where you're saying we're, we'll we'll send everything back, so we're sending a plane wave going back to Earth that's maybe a 100 picoseconds wide or something like that. Picoseconds three, I mean, a millimeter is three picoseconds. So you're talking about, you know, a, a, a wall of light that's this thick, maybe, or this thick or something like that. You couldn't see it, but if you could see it, it would be like a huge pancake that might be 100,000 kilometers across and a few centimeters thick. And and actually, the math works very much like if you were phase coherence, it's just your 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 wavelength is much bigger. It's more like the, 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 the thickness of this thing. And so you have um, a Fresnel size, a diffraction size back on Earth, which would cover the whole inner solar system. And so in the whole inner solar system, you'd have this wave front coming through. And then you would have, a, you know, because you'd have instead of one probe sending at a time, you'd have a thousand probes sending at a time, you'd be getting a thousand photons instead of one photon, and you have a much higher bit rate. So that was that was like what drove that. That was like, we gotta, we gotta have a higher bit rate back. Because, I mean, my feeling is it's just, it's not realistic to say we're gonna be getting this little tiny trickle of, no, we wanna combine it together, and we wanna have a high bit rate so that people can see pictures, you know, like more or less in real time. Um, you know, I mean, 20 years later, well, 24 years later, because you've got 20 years to get there and then four years to get back. But, you know, when they get the data, they want to see, they're going to want to see things. And, um, but then it was like, well, what else can you do with that? Well, <clears throat> the second thing we realized, um, we're going to have a hard time predicting where Proxima B, the planet is, 24 years, 20 years in advance or even 15 years in advance. Now remember, we're always four years in retard and in, in, in retarded here, right? We're, if we look at Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri right now, we're seeing it as it was four point something years ago. Once the probe gets there, it's gonna be seeing it in real time. So <clears throat> if we sent data right now to a probe that was just about to get to Proxima Centauri, that, that data would be you know, by the time it got there, eight years late, four years for the light to get to us, four years from the light to get to them. And so, and, and so there's going to be a huge delay in the, the data is going to be very retarded, very delayed, any data from Earth, you know, because it may not be possible to communicate like that in such a, you know, just before it gets to Proxima Centauri. So, but whether it's, you know, that or a year before that or five years or even 10 years, it doesn't matter that much. You're still talking about you're going to be using data that is low, that is late. Okay, so if you, Proxima Centauri is in a very small orbit, we actually don't know much about the orbit. We don't know the inclination of the orbit right now, but it, presumably we will fix that. We have ways of fixing that. But if you just sort of go through what can we do from Earth, it's likely that that orbit error is going to be about 100,000 kilometers. So, you when you get there, you may be a hundred thousand kilometers off. That's not from much, where you though. want to be. Well, I mean, it is and it is. That's less than if the orbit between the Earth and the Moon. Yes, but I mean, imagine you have a small spacecraft and you're trying to take a close-up picture of the Earth, and you're a hundred thousand kilometers away. It's not a close-up picture anymore. All right. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll see that. And so the idea was, well, we spread this swarm across a, uh, laterally 100,000 kilometers. So we have a pie plate that's 100,000 kilometers across and whatever thickness is appropriate, you know, probably 1,000 kilometers or something like that. We haven't really settled on that. Um, there's no real driver there. So, it, you know, might be thicker, it might be thinner. We'll see. But uh, <clears throat> so that something will be close, you know, to Proxima B when you get there. You can say that some... Some set of these objects are going to be close 
Um, and then there's a very interesting problem. Almost certainly you will gather more data than you can send back. And because if each swarm, if each probe is taking pictures, you might have, you know, 100,000 pictures. 100 from each probe and 1,000 probe, 100,000 pictures. That's more than you're likely to get back, at least at high bit rate. And so you have this interesting problem. Well, the swarm has to communicate. Remember, the whole swarm has to act coherently. They all have to send something back. They have to decide what that something is going to be. They can't use it help from Earth because it's an eight-year you know, round trip there. So no. And you don't want to be sending back thumbnails and then waiting eight years to say, yeah, you send picture 37. So you have to have, and we haven't settled this problem. And it's actually, I think it's an interesting um, machine learning type problem. Because I think one of the things you'd want to do is have lots and lots of pictures of planets here in our solar system. Have scientists rate each one to say, this is a good one. Not so, and then turn that into some sort of neural net or something that can then say, here is the best thing to send back. And then you have to ask, well, all right, so do you just take like the top 10 photos and send them back? Or do you send the best photo and then do you send them the photo, you know, the best photo that's most different from that one? Because you wouldn't want to, you know, if the top 10 photos all look the same, you probably don't want to send, you know, 10 copies back, that, you know, you know, the, the, 10, the 10 guys that happened to get closest all took a good snapshot. No, it's like you want to have different stuff. It's like nighttime or daytime, you know. Terminator and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and then, of course, that, there's other data. There's magnetometer data. If you have impacts, you know, we might impact the, you know. Again, apologies in advance for... Apologies in advance, planet. yes. If, yeah. it's a, if, it's a, if it's a highly advanced civilization, they might take that, you know, they, they might not appreciate our scientific, uh, uh, you know, interest. Um, they might view it as an attack even. I don't know. Um, it's hard to hard to judge. I, I think in a three body problem, they probably would, right? Um, um, so, um, I mean, there, there's there's actually a, an interesting machine learning type problem or autonomous, you know, a spacecraft problem right there, in that you have to decide what you're going to do, and you have to do that without any hope of doing anything, getting anything from Earth, and um, you know, and I think that's going to take a good deal of work, actually. Um, so, but I guess I feel like I'm hearing a different, you know, when we, we talked before and in your paper, you talk about this idea of potentially daisy chaining the signals home. That it's not just showing up as one coherent swarm, but there is there are other configurations that might make sense as well that you could transmit and retransmit. I personally have never been a big back. fan of the daisy chain idea. Hmm. Okay. And because one reason so one reason for that is is that you you've you've introduced lots of you know single points of failure if, if it's a strict daisy chain. In other words, they, for the for the readers or for the listeners, the daisy chain means that you send to your you know you're at Proxima Centauri, let's say you're going to send it to the spacecraft that's closest to you in, in your in your rear, and then they're going to send it to the spacecraft that's closest to them in their rear, and then that, and so on. And the trouble with that is, well, you have, you know, those spacecraft are all not crucial points. If one of them dies, your data may not get back and you could have multiple paths and all like that. But, it, it, you know, you have to deal with that somehow. Um, but the other problem is you're competing now with, you know, small telescopes that are, let's say, 10 centimeters or maybe 10 maybe a meter or even maybe 10 meters versus huge kilometer scale arrays back on Earth. And it's almost always cheaper to make the array back on Earth bigger. You know, that's almost always cheaper. Than but back to saying. what we were talking about before, that if you do send a swarm that maybe has a little bit, can, can give each other a little bit of advance notice, maybe some of the spacecraft that are further down the chain can start to change their orientation oh, yeah. to, that's, to that's, aim for the target. That is for sure. And, and there's... Once you've once you've made this swarm, you actually have a fairly powerful tool, and that yes, you could then communicate because they could all communicate. They could, you know, this photonic trick you could use for a swarm behind you, and you could say do this or do that. Um, 
Now, and that's even more autonomy if you think about it. It's, right. So you could send some scouts and then the scouts could say, here's where the planet is. And then the next wave is already kind of changing yes. their angle of attack so that as many of them yes. as possible can. You see, can, if you wait on Earth, it takes too long. Mm -hmm. I send a scout. I find out where the planet is. It takes 20 years to get there and four years to get back. So now 24 years after I sent the scout, let's say I send the scout in 2040. Then 2064, now I can send the main pro No, that's too long. You know, you, know, you want to send multiple ones. And um, um, I think that I, I, my personal, I mean, you know, who knows what, what the people that are running this will want to do, but my personal feeling is, yes, they're going to want to send multiple multiple uh, um, uh, multiple swarms and to multiple objects and uh, um, and so what kind of bandwidth do you think that we would get and you know in general terms with this swarm sort of sending all of its data back simultaneously our goal was to match new horizons new horizons sent back I believe three gigabytes in a year and we think we could do that so all the new horizons programs pro photos you see. Now, New Horizons did have the advantage that they could send back thumbnails and then the people on Earth could say, yes, yeah, send us this particular photo. Um, and I don't know if they sent all, literally all the photos back or not. I think they may have by now because they've had a lot of time. But, um, but New Horizons was designed, in fact, I mean, they made the deliberate engineering choice not to have the biggest antenna and not to have the biggest uh, radio transmitter that they could to save power and to save mass, to meet their mass budget. So they made a deliberate decision to say, instead of getting all the data back in a week, like like Viking did, I'm sorry, not Viking, uh, Voyagers did after their encounters, you got the data back fairly quickly. No, we're going to take, you know, we're going to take a year. I mean, that was a deliberate decision to, to save money, really, when you get down to it. And um, in our case, it's more like, well, Voyage, Viking, sorry. New Horizons did a great job, and if we could match that, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. And so, um, now, like, I mean, I think for a lot of people, like getting those first images from another planet in another star system would be amazing. But then also, we would become bored um, because that's just human beings. And you know, yes, we're getting one picture of Proxima Centauri B. We're getting one picture of the of the the planets at Alpha Centauri, we're getting one picture of Wolf 359's planets. Um, but I think to kind of go to the next level and actually have continuous science done, we want a way that we can go and stay in a star system to decelerate and actually arrive and not bust through at 20% the speed of light. In sort of orders of magnitude, do you think, like if we potentially could take a crack at sending a breakthrough star shot in the next, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, and then maybe it'll take 20 years to to arrive at its destination. How much longer do you think before proper interstellar missions are are on the table? I'd be surprised if it was ha if that happened in this century, frankly. Um, I mean, the the the, the uh, using the interstellar medium to slow you down is just not going to work for that. It's just it's it's too dim. I mean, we're to, you know we're interested in changing our velocities by a kilometer per second or something like that. Well, that's if you think about you know sixty thousand kilometers a second. No, we're, we're many orders of magnitude away from being able to do anything there um, and to be able to stop um, the. I mean, what you're really talking about is either having very large, you know, I mean, well, I mean, you can just do the math. If it takes 100 gigawatts to send the gram, it would take 100 terawatts to send the kilogram and so on. But that still doesn't get you to stop. The stopping is the hard part. And I, I have a feeling that maybe, maybe, I mean, if you go back to Ursula K. Le Guin, her NAFL drives were actually some sort of like soliton type, um, like Abcure, Abcure type, you know, um, drive. So in other words, it was a bending of space time. It wasn't just a, a rocket, you know, 
it was actually some sort of, and, she, and of course she was not interested. I mean, she's not a physicist. She wasn't interested <laughs> in physics, but you know, she, but she did describe it. She's like, Oh, this is, this is how it works. Kind of, and, you know, you're not going to understand it. Cause I don't understand it. You know, like, um, in fact, one of her stories, it's just actually like, well, the character says, yeah, I'm not a physicist. I don't know how these things work. I just know, you know, you can do this and get there. And, um, but, uh, um, Maybe that's possible. Maybe you can do that. I mean, the, the trouble the trouble with the Abcure ab drive is that it requires unobtainium. It actually requires stuff of negative energy density. But why does it require stuff of negative energy density? Because you're going faster than the speed of light, um, which you can do in general relativity with space-time. Space-time can travel space faster than the speed of light. So you're basically like riding a space-time wave. Well, maybe if you're not going faster than the speed of light, you're you don't you, you well i mean just you would expect then you would not require negative energy density so maybe you can require you know matter or material that you could actually make you know so obtainium as opposed to unobtainium i don't know that's just pure speculation you know i've never seen any any good physics on that um yeah yeah i know um you know sunny white is is trying to figure it out but uh yes know. and i actually worked with him um and that's a whole nother interview. Let's, let's <laughs> right, keep yeah. it for a whole nother interview. Um, no. uh, so let's talk about like like where we go from here, because it, it really seems to me like the next step is to scale this down in terms of laser power and start practicing. Like let's start sending, let's build well, the, the laser facility step. on the moon and then let's practice. Let's send these to Mars, let's send them to Pluto, let's send them to Oumuamua and, and into the interstellar medium and start to get a sense of, of the actual engineering that's involved before we, because... So w we were talking about sending things at si just, just all, basically all our discussions about been sending things at 60,000 kilometers a second. If you could do 100 kilometers a second, you could basically go anywhere you might care to mention in the solar system anywhere we know about even planet x or nine you know michael brown's planet planet x or he calls planet nine out there in a year or two the whole solar system would be available you said no any of these objects you could just you could you know even the, even the inner part of the Oort cloud you could just say we'll go out there we'll just go there you know and a year makes a big difference if you said well, you know, here's this problem with, you know, we're trying to resolve with, you know, all right, we'll spend, we'll send a probes and a year from now we'll have an answer. That seems like worth doing, even if the answer is just, well, like take, go back to one eye, umuamua. We could get there in a couple of years with these little probes at that velocity. Now we're going by them very fast, but you could take a picture and then you could say, does this look like an alien spaceship or not? If it looks like an alien spaceship, maybe we should send a heavy probe there. If it looks like just a big rock, you know, maybe not, you know. But you, I mean, I don't think that they would be the, the you know, like all, the only way we'd be exploring or, the, you know, it would take over from everything else. But it would make the exploration of the solar system a much more doable thing where you could just say, well, you know, if it's an interesting thing, we'll spend some fraction of our effort and we'll send probes out there. And what I've been trying, one of what I've been actually trying to get the, the powers that be interested in with absolutely no success I must say so far is potentially hazardous asteroids we should send probes like this to every PHA because one of the problems you have with PHAs is if you think about you know the, the, the you know the, the drills they do with hazardous asteroids oh my god the asteroid's going to hit the earth what do we do they don't know the orbit they don't know the size of the body they don't know the rotation period they don't know anything about it well, we could just find that out. You know, we could just say, if this asteroid looks like it's potentially hazardous, fire up your laser, <laughs> shoot a um, shoot a pipe plate at it, and, you know, and we'll get the size, we'll get a picture, we'll get the rotation rate probably, we, you know, we get whatever it is you want, really. Now, we're not going to get a huge amount of detail. It's not, again, this will never replace the bigger, the bigger spacecraft in terms of, like, complicated measurements and stuff. But you could get what you need to know very quickly. And if another interstellar asteroid came through, you could do the same thing with it too. And so it really does sound like a sort of a fundamentally different approach to exploring the solar system, at least at a surface level that I think right it is. now, I think it is. we send a flagship mission or even like a, 
you know, a billion dollar mission to an asteroid or to some other place. And each one is custom built. It's bespoke for its purpose, as opposed to sending out thousands and thousands of these little spacecraft across the entire solar system. Each one can provide a little bit of information, find the interesting stuff that we can then send follow-ups on. But also we just learn a tremendous amount about powerful lasers. Think about it in terms of the human aspect. We have right now arguments about, I mean, we've not sent any probes to the ice giants, Neptune and Uranus, or Uranus and Neptune, since Voyager. It's getting up to 50 years or something like that. Um, the, The people that have studied that, you know, who are involved with the Voyager mission, they're all retired probably by now. You know, the community is like desperate. You know, we need the ability to advance things. We've been working on the same set of data for all these years. We need more. And but but then that's competing against Titan and it's competing against Venus. And it's like all of these people are like, you know, these huge missions take so long and they're so expensive and so they're so rare that yes, they're very, very cool. And uh, you know, it's amazing what's what we're doing. You know, helicopters on Titan, you know. I mean, that's just amazing. But you know, we could do a lot more in, in a sense of exploring things, you know, with these small, small bodies, um, like the Neptune's moon Triton as geysers, we think, actually, that we did, we, they didn't think that at Voyager, but we think that now, are the geysers permanent? Do the geysers have, like, what kind of, do they have water in them? We can answer all those questions, you know, we could, we could do that in a year or two, as opposed to, I mean, right now, if we're going to go to Triton, it's a 10-year trip, and it's a 10-year to make the spacecraft. So we're really looking at, like, 2045, maybe, before we actually get any data back, you know, something like that. That's a long time. Yeah, you can imagine Um, this world where, like, a scientist is, like, saying to someone at NASA, you know, like, I've got a question about Triton. And the NASA is saying, do you want to send a spacecraft? Yeah, let's do that. So I want to send a probe? Sure. And then, you know, an hour later, off a probe goes to Triton, and, and three days later the the data comes back well i mean like three years but yes three i mean if you're going the speed of light yes well i was yeah that's Uh, what i was saying you know we're up we're up to 20 percent the speed of light now and we're but you don't have to get up to 20 percent of the no of of course you you could do it with a lot less investment and and yes and that would give you the the sort of the i mean it's like you, you have to use training wheels before you you know do the tour de france right the going to proxima centauri is like the tour de france you got to start with small local things and then build up um you know and you're until you're sending missions that are really are going far out there and and it it feels to me like that's what we'll see like i think a lot of people are real we're really excited when the breakthrough starshot program was announced and the funding was provided and all of the sort of big name people who came on board and we saw a lot of papers but i think we will know the rubber is starting to hit the road when there is a laser on the far side of the moon that that people are starting to do tests start to explore the solar system when when that becomes routine and we know how to do this very efficiently and effectively then we can set our sights to the stars but it's it's a little counterintuitive to me to set your sights at the stars first before well, I mean, properly yes, exploring you, the solar system you have a very good point there when i started working with breakthrough starshot there were people who were saying you know, more or less effect, more or less just like this. Well, the, you know, we're going to build all of this. And that's the first thing we're going to do is to go to Proxima Centauri. And I was like, no, 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 no. You're going to start. No, that's not how you do space travel. <laughs> that's not, you know, that's just not going to, that's not going to fly. Literally, you got to start with things that are closer and then build up to it and then do repeated missions. And so that when you start talking, I'm going to, I'm going to expend a, you know, a, 20 years of my life working on this thing, you got a pretty good idea it's going to work because you've tested it on all kinds of local things and, you know, and then, and do science too. And it's a little frustrating because I don't think the space agencies get this yet. I don't think, you know, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to get a hold of one of those Navy, um, uh, Laser cannon, I guess. They, I don't know what they call them. You know, what the what the military approved military terminology is, but they're in the hundreds of kilowatts. I I have no I have no access to classified information. So this is my speculation, but they're up in the hundreds of kilowatts. You know, if you had an orbiting 
thing, you, should, you, would, you, you could get a noticeable thrust from that, an orbiting pie plate. And why don't we start doing that? You know, I mean, it would take some money, but it wouldn't take a huge amount of money. I mean, to me, that's, yes, to do the Starshot thing with a huge array on the moon, that's going to take a lot of money, but that's going to be down the road. We could start with a lot. We could do a lot right now with, with actually probably like the equivalent of one, you know, flagship mission or something. We'd fund the whole program for, you know, a decade. And then, you know, we can see where we were. And I have to say, this is part of the problem with the decadal survey uh, philosophy of doing things. None of this is in the decadal survey. So if you go to the planetary science division of NASA and say, hey, we want to do this, it's like, well, get it in the decadal survey. And so that means you've already you punted it to the 2030s kind of. Right. But, That's, you know, I mean, do you not want the Habitable Worlds Observatory? Do you not want two missions that are going to go to Venus? Do you not? Like, the problem is, is that there's, as you we both said, right, there's, just, there's so many wonderful places to explore. And so... You know, more budget for NASA, I believe, is the solution to this. Marshall, what are you obsessed about right now? Ha! The, the commercial economy of the moon. Um, that's a thing? That's possible? Well, that's something we're trying to create. You know, how do you, how do you build a commercial economy on the moon? And I, I do lunar work, you know, and... There's a, there's a lot of interest in, you know, how do we get from here to there? How do we take, how, how do we do all, you could put it almost as, how do we do what Elon Musk did with, with getting to Leo, low Earth orbit? You know, NASA is funding the lunar economy by funding CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Experiment Providers. Or I think that's what it stands for. Um, and so the Intuitive Machines, Astrobotic, Fireflies, other companies are going to be sending stuff to the moon. They're all, they all are selling space for commercial uh, uses. Now, right now, those commercial uses tend to be really governmental. So it's, yeah, it's a commercial payload, but it's really funded by NASA or the Air Force or maybe ESA or something like that. But I think there's a real potential for that changing fairly rapidly once these flights start getting regular, once... You know, assuming that this this lunar program continues, and assume if you can just say, yeah, we're going to be sending two or three flights to a year to the moon, and they work, and they you know they're successful. And by the way, for a million dollars a kilo, and I think that's about the right number, you could send you know you could send a, a test, some sort of experiment or something. And that's where I think you're going to start seeing like mining interest and the like get interested, because to them a million dollars is not that much money, and but they're used to like. Prospecting, they want to prospect. You know, I've actually talked to some of these people, and it's like they have they have their way of doing things. And I mean, imagine if they could buy kilograms of gold for a million dollars a piece. Well, that doesn't that you know. I mean, that, that was my initial reaction to asteroid mining. Yeah if, yeah, if if you had an asteroid and you said you found that aliens had left bars of platinum and gold. It would literally not be make economic sense to return those. Now, of course, in reality, it would because you would want to make damn sure you understood what the aliens were doing. Right, the scientific but, value would be priceless, but the actual plutonium the, itself the, the, or the but, platinum but, itself is is less than the but it, cost of the mission. But yes, if platinum is like fifty thousand dollars a kilo or something like that. So a million dollars a kilo is now. I mean, we, I've actually, believe it or not, talked to a jeweler. Who's very interested in making very expensive like jewelry for mostly for men actually, so like bolo ties or tie tacks or something like that made of like lunar material or whatever or asteroid material. So you could, but there would be the first sales of that, right? Right. The first guy to buy that might spend a million dollars for his bolo tie, say, or something, but not the tenth guy or the hundredth guy. Some, you know, that that would that. You know, but but if you wanted to make a, if you wanted to make some money really quickly, that might be the way to do it. You know, okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, I get that idea. So, uh, if people want to track your work and sort of see what you're up to, what's the best place to do that? Archive. <laughs> they are the, the. Yeah. So put in a Google Scholar tracking query. I'm on Google. I, I'm on everything. I'm on yeah. ResearchGate. I'm on all of those things. So. 
I'm easy to find that way. Well, and you're but very, I mean, you're very active. I mean, like, I think, you know, we've been chatting back and forth on various social media platforms for years Oh, and now. NASA ADS is very good, too. Yes. I highly recommend the NASA uh, Harvard-Smithsonian ADS. A, a vote for me as well. I, I have a browser tab open always that is searching through that for interesting stories. So, uh, well, But it is kind of interesting that, that, that you can't get everything from one source still. Like if I have certain papers, it's like I can't get them from archive. I have to get, you know, yep. you know, I even use science gate very occasionally, you know, but it's, it's still, you there's still like gaps that you just, you can't, or I ask colleagues, can you get me this paper? Or I ask the author, can you send me same, a copy Same of this for me as well. Yeah. Or I ask the journal. You think we'd be at the stage where it's just like, it's all out there, but it's not. No. And it's kind of frustrating. Well, and for me, that gives me an advantage, right? That I'm willing to do the work and find the stories and talk to the people. And, you know, it's, I get an advantage because then I get a lot of scoops. I don't, did, did anybody else report on your, on your mesh network apart from us? I don't think so. So no, and actually, that's it, it. Got the most reads of ResearchGate of any of my publications, and that includes the International Celestial Reference Frame, which is a incredibly highly cited. Um, well, there you go. There's you the know. universe today bump. So, uh, well, it's so. a pleasure to talk to you, and you know, pleasure like to talk to I, you. you know, I find your work really interesting, and often, you know, you are all over the place thinking of clever ideas, and those are the kinds of things that I'm most interested in. So. So hopefully we'll have you back on for whatever new idea you're thinking of uh, a couple of years from now. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to it. All right. Take care. You take care. I'm going to give you some more of my thoughts in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shibelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonad, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verabioff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. Obviously, I would love to see a spacecraft go to another star system. I want to see what Proxima Centauri B looks like. I want to be able to see these worlds up close. I mean, there are whatever, 100 million stars in the Milky Way. Many of these are going to have planets. Like imagine the variety of planets that would be out there. And yet we can only imagine them. We can play our video games. We can't go there close. And so it really would be great to have a practical spacecraft to go. And But to cross these distances, you need enormous amounts of energy and the kind of engineering that we just haven't mastered today. There's only a few ways, like you could use solar sails, maybe you could use antimatter. Uh, there aren't a lot of options to be able to cross that distance. And so it's a completely different way of flying in space than the sort of traditional chemical rockets, even the ion engines that are used in some spacecraft, that we need to become accustomed and practiced. And so when you think about this kind of new paradigm for exploring the solar system, that it's it's about sending lots of tiny spacecraft that are quick and disposable, and yet give you some of that initial data to figure out, is this a place you want to go? Or you send swarms of spacecraft to gather science together at some destination. It completely changes the way you sort of interface with the rest of the solar system. And it's really worth exploring. And so even if we never do send a mission to Proxima Centauri within our lifetime that goes 20% the speed of light, my hope is that we move down this journey and build a better understanding just of the solar system to begin with, and then mature this technology. And then we'll know whether or not we can actually go to another star system or not. And it's, I'm pretty excited about what's possible. All right. Hope you enjoyed the interview and we'll see you next time.